So what do you do? I now mm -hmm. I study English. You study. Uh, what did you do in 1995? I not remember. You don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Your job in 1995. Oh, uh, what did you do? You see. I I uh, I worked a teacher. Okay. I worked as a teacher. As a teacher. As okay. a teacher. Okay. So what did you do? In 1995, I worked as a teacher. Okay, you can close your books for a second. Um, let's see, Fiametta, in Italy, do you have anything similar to a free school? Uh, actually, I don't think so. No? no. How about in no. Korea, Hyungbun? We have some, but I think it's not usual. Yeah. It's not the usual. Yeah. Vanch, would you like to go to a free school? Well, not really. <laughs> Why? I, I don't know. Just we have one similar school in Slovenia. And what I saw, not, I don't like it. Like, no, not um, for you. What I saw on television and things like that. Okay. Yeah. How about you, Roman? I've never heard about the free school in Switzerland, but I'm not sure if I would like to go there. No? Because if you don't have to go to lessons, you will just choose the lessons you will you like and uh -huh. you will miss. Oh, yes, I, I usually read um, in the afternoon too. Yeah. Um, um, but recently, uh, um, I don't read, I didn't read top one. Uh, so what time of the time you read most? Um, maybe. Um, I like music, so I um, I read the music uh, about uh, about. Um, I read most my dictionary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, shall we, uh, shall we go through the, the answers? Okay, um, for number two then, second sentence, um, A or B? A and B. Okay. Um, and number three? Number four? A and B. And finally? A Yes. Good. So the verbs that we're going to choose from, at the top of task seven, we've got a list of, how many have we got? Ten verbs there. Okay, can you just for a moment look at those and see if there's any that you don't recognise? So for example, I might point to Jin Wan and he'll say, orange. Uh, easy? Okay, I'm going to point to Anna. She'll say chicken, okay? 
You've got three seconds. If you don't say the name of a food in three seconds, I'm afraid you're out of the game. When I say, what can you read, everybody says a book, and you're like, oh. But if you look around you, you can look, what have we got on the notice board here? What can you see? What are they? On the notice board. Notices, yep, you can see notices. Advertisements, yeah. Which one first? Yeah. Yep. And what did that? What did we follow with that? Um, follow that with last time? What was the other sentence that you saw? Most famous business. No. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's the first one. Yeah, that's the one we saw before, wasn't it? You put them together. So they're the first two. Now try and sort out the others. Which one did you like, Kimberly? Oh. I prefer the fourth picture, fourth lesson. Uh -huh. Maybe in the kindergarten or maybe in the primary, primary school or kind of private. Could have been a private school. Yeah. What adjectives did it make you think of? Which one? This the um, primary school or the nursery school? Or any of them? Intensive? Intensive? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the picture. Okay, should we check those? <coughs> so, uh, Hidayat, would you like to read us our new sentence two? Two. Uh -huh. This program was established to improve access to medical care. Excellent, good. Yeah. Pimpa, number three. Research expenditures have increased to nearly $350 million. Good, excellent. Can you think of something like for very hot? Very hot weather, or you know, like the earth getting yeah. hotter, maybe yeah. global, uh, yeah. global, global, global warming, warming, warming yeah. and greenhouse effects, something like that. Yeah. That'd be lovely. Let's go back to this. How many syllables in this word? <laughs> Two. Two. Okay, how many vowel sounds in this word? One. 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 So how many syllables? Greenhouse effects. One of the things that always interests me is how, how close teachers get to students and, and, mm. and how appropriate that is. How many syllables in this word? Yeah, I think you... It really depends on the class, doesn't it? Uh, nationality can come into it, whether people are comfortable with how close you are to them. Is that something to do with nationality? Um, yeah, I just think you have to take that into consideration. Um, just choosing one position to stand in um, and saying, well, that's where I stand isn't really the case. I mean, you have to, um, you know, depending on what you're doing and where the people are from as well. Um, Southern Europeans might be more comfortable with you being close to them or crouching next to them than than um, other nationalities, for example. What's your reaction to the clips you've just been watching? My immediate reaction, um, what struck me first was the variety of teaching styles that was evident in all of the clips. So that got me thinking about teaching styles in general and my own teaching style and what it was and whether I've actually got one or whether it's better to think of it as having multiple styles that you adapt to certain situations, different classes, different tasks. I looked at the clips and I thought, well, you know, um, do I, am I like that in, in other situations? And I thought, well, I am. Um, and the style that you take, um, take into the class will depend a lot on what you're teaching, who you're teaching, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I think it's a, it is true that people have different styles, but I think each person also has a number of styles that they adapt to a particular situation. Um, did you think carefully about things like standing and seating, or is that just something you sort of do without thinking too carefully about it? I think you consciously think about it sometimes, but I think um, it would be true to say that it's something that comes with experience. I mean, you just you start knowing... Um, the best place to be for a certain task, for a certain activity. Um, 
and that could be for a number of factors. Um, whether the exercise is teacher-centred or student-centred, um, whether there's um, an element of correction needed, um, does that correction involve all of the students or one individual? If it does involve all the group, then it might be best to, to be near the board, so you can use that as an aid. Um, so there are a number of factors that I'd say. Um, and also, I think sometimes, you know, if you're looking at, for example, accuracy, then it's necessary for you to be next to the students because that's the whole point. You're supposed to be correcting them. Um, for other activities, for example, brainstorming, it might, be, might not be necessary for you to be there at all. I mean, you could just leave a group and come back to them and see what they've come up with. I was interested in, uh, in the contrast between um, uh, when you were working with the individual uh, groups of people, you tended to sort of stand by the table and, and mm -hmm. do it like that. And we saw some of the other teachers were sort of sitting on tables, crouching on the yeah. floor, that kind of thing. I wondered if you had any comments on that. Um, yeah, well, I think, again, it was interesting seeing the other teachers and the other clips. Um, I think there are moments when I will crouch next to a group of students, and I think sometimes by crouching next to a group uh, and not being visible to other groups, you're not interfering with what they're doing. By standing up, you're still visible. People might be listening to what you're saying to a particular student, not focusing on what they're supposed to be doing with their group. And I've noticed that in a few situations where people have um, sort of looked over, you know, what's he correcting? Shall I write that down? Um, if you're not visible, you can help the group that you're working with, allowing the others to get on with it and then move on. So I think crouching does have its, have its role sometimes, you know. Is there any uh, time when it might be sort of inappropriate? I think you have to take into consideration how well, nationalities, uh, different cultural uh, backgrounds, um, and also how well you know the students. Um, I wouldn't, on the first day, during a getting to know you, go up and crouch next to a, a group of students, because I think that might be sort of seen as an invasion of um, personal space. But if you know the group and you've been working with them and you've got a good rapport, then that might be appropriate, it might be seen as, as, as friendly. Um, and so I think there are a number of things you've got to consider. Okay, you're going to ask each other questions about these things. Mm. Have a look at the example. Did people drive cars a hundred years ago? And you have to think, hmm, a hundred years ago, 1906. 19? Did we drive cars in 1906? Uh, what do you think, Patricia? Did people drive cars 100 years ago? Uh, what, uh... One hundred years ago. This year is two thousand and six. Yes. One hundred years ago oh, is no. nineteen oh six. Okay, so your answer can be yes, I think they did. Repeat? Yes. Yes, I think they did. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. sure. Um no, they didn't. No, no they, they didn't. didn't. Okay, so Franca, did people drive cars 100 years ago? Yes, I think they did. Okay. Good. Um, Arno, can you ask Sinai a question about something else? Uh, yes, use question. this question, but use a different object. Okay. Did people ride bikes 100 years ago? I'm not sure. Okay, good. So, what I want you to do is you two work together, mm -hmm. ask each other questions about these, and you three work together. I'm going to um, mix you all up 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to give half of you a quote. A quote is something which somebody said, okay? And the other half, I'm going to give you something that you read. And you need to stand up and find your new partner, okay? So this is an example of one. It says, this is a quote, and it says, 200 pages of excitement, 200 pages. Now, what would you read that's 200 pages long? A book. Yes, or a, another word for a book, a storybook, a? So. A novel, that's right, a novel. So they belong together. So this person needs to find this person and then they need to sit down together. Okay? So I'm going to give you each one. You take one. Lovely. Which one? <laughs> and uh, you two can share that one. Okay. Um, I'd like you to read it to the other people in the class. Don't show it to anybody. Just read it. Okay, listen to each other. And when you think you've found your new partner, sit down together. Okay? So stand up and walk around. Okay. Well done. That's excellent. Now we're going to move on to a bit more vocabulary. Not all of these are verbs now. In numbers one to four below, we've got a choice of two words or phrases. And you want to cross the one out that you think is informal, leaving the formal of the two options. So if we look at number one together, so sentence one, the government has made good progress or considerable progress in solving environmental problems. Which one sounds more formal? Cross out the Lovely, yes, yeah, so cross out the good. Okay, we'd like to do the same for numbers two, three, and four. So sentence one, the government has made good progress or considerable progress in solving environmental What's your reaction to the clips of people giving instructions that we've just been watching? Quite positive, because it's nice to see that it works. Um, there's instructions given in different ways, and sometimes you give instructions and you wonder whether they've sunk in or not. And sometimes they have, and sometimes they haven't, and sometimes you don't know whether they have or not. Um, if they haven't, then you can either let them carry on and try to get them to finally understand what they are supposed to be doing. Uh, or you can, perhaps if there's two students who don't know what they're supposed to be doing, you can ask them to watch what's going on. Um, sometimes you do have to just stop everyone and, and, and start all over again. Because? Well, you normally see when you haven't explained it properly and everything, well, basically everyone is doing what they shouldn't be doing or they're doing something not quite in the way that you wanted them to do it. Um, that probably means you haven't explained it properly. Um, so you just need to give them a little bit more encouragement, perhaps another demonstration of what's supposed to be going on. Is giving instructions something you can be trained to do or do you just kind of learn it on the job? I think you can be... Mm, it, it's funny because I think I learned it on the job and it is trial and error, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I think you have to give instructions in different ways, if only for variety. But um, I think an important thing about giving instructions is that it's interesting for students to hear you giving instructions. So in a sense, uh, giving instructions is sort of good comprehensible input. It's, it's Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think any language in the classroom is, is useful language. And in the clip, for example, where we saw you giving an instruction, had you, had you planned to do it that way? Was it very carefully thought out, or did you just do it sort of on the basis of what it felt like at the time? Uh, it wasn't carefully planned. Um, I think that's what I would have done naturally uh, with that level and that activity without thinking about it too much. Um, they were very low-level students, so I did have to be quite explicit and um, give a, make sure that the demonstration I gave was very clear before I started the activity. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked with that particular group.
So just to begin with, working with um, in partners, let's see who we've got. Let's have you two. We'll have you two. You two, you two, and you three can work together. Um, I'd like you, in two minutes, to write down a list of as many things that you can think that you read. OK? Um, anything that you read, just write a list in your group. Two minutes. Ready, steady, go. OK. Now, what I need is tables with... This is a table, so what's that? Yes, people, students, and students' noses, just so you know. OK, so I need uh, tables with four people sitting around them, or it might be three for some of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yes, so uh, if you could come and sit over here, bring a chair. Um, and Jin Wan, can you also come over here? Uh, you stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jim Wan, if you come over here. OK. And can you two come around? Out. move over here. Can you three all come over here? Uh, if you sit in that chair there, that's fine. Uh, yes, you can leave things. Although, can you take things that you don't need off the table? Can you take everything off the table? Does everyone have a chair? Ah, it's two threes and one four. Right. I don't know whether you agree with that. What do you think about that? So I'm going to ask you to talk about that in, in groups of three, three and four. And I'm, I wonder if I can move you um, just a little bit so that we don't have people who are from the same country. Yes. So maybe, Jessica, could you talk with Luca and Lourdes? Um, so Luca and Lourdes, if, if you come over here, and Yusra... If you can talk with Simon and Juanma. No, I, I, that doesn't quite work. And then Inmar, if you come over here. That's great. Yes, if you come over here to maybe change places with. So I go there. Yes, Lourdes, Lourdes if you come over here with Luca. And Yusra with Juanma and maybe. Um, Jong Young, if you could go over and join them as well, and then Inma, if you could come up here. <laughs> Eleven, yes. So, uh, if you could come and sit over here, bring a chair. Like just then, when I didn't quite get it right, because I think it's part of the. How often do you use different student groupings in a lesson? It depends on the students. It depends on the. Um, the activity. In this case, I wanted to put them into, I wanted to make new groups because of the activity, but often I, um, I, I might just do pair work or, uh, but I use pair work more than group work. Definitely. And why do you use pair work? Well, and group work, but pair work especially. The great thing about pair work is that everyone is either talking or listening. In group work, somebody you might, if you had a group of four, two people might be talking for most of the three or four minutes, and one person might be drifting off into, into a daydream. In your clip, you put particular students with particular students. Why did you do that? Because the activity I was doing was related to a, a particular cultural experience based on the, um, the, the student's country of origin or I wanted them to share their own experience with students from other countries, so I needed them to be in, in groups. Um, or I needed them to, to exchange ideas not f with people not from their own country. Do you do that a lot of the time, actually choosing specific students? Um, it depends on the, st on the group, and it depends on the... If a group is working fine, I will, 
I will probably leave them be. But if I feel that one student is maybe not getting so much of a chance to talk or two people don't, uh, don't work well together, I would then shift it around. It depends on the circumstances, I would say. But it's largely because of the individual student? Yes, yes, and I think one responds to, to a dynamic. If the class is feeling a bit flat, you might pep it up by, by putting them in different groups. Okay, you've got one more minute, guys. And this is walked, because it's no voice. Voice moved. In the second sentence. And then new information comes at the end. Again. Um, and if you organise the information like this, it's clearer. It's just easier to read the text. Okay, let's pass one on to Pimp Pepper. Two. Okay. It's all, all ready to go. Okay. Carry on. See what you can do. Five groups. What's your reaction to the different clips you've seen of all these different seating arrangements? It was really interesting to see sort of the same classrooms being used in, in different ways by, by the different teachers using the different seating arrangements and different activities. In your lesson you had the students sitting at two separate tables. Is there any special reason you did that? I wanted to um, make them feel more, more comfortable and put them at their ease and I thought if they were all seated around one large table then sort of certain members of the group might have dominated the, the feedback sessions and also even though they're a proficiency group there are sort of varying levels within the group and a couple of them were new to the class that week so really it was just to make them feel more comfortable. Do you use that kind of arrangement, students divided for example into two groups around two separate tables, do you use that arrangement quite often? It's an arrangement that I prefer because I think it's easier to monitor students and to help them reformulate their ideas or their writing in a more discreet way that's not in front of all of their peers. Um, and also, I think, for higher levels, certainly it encourages learner, learner autonomy. Because? Because I think if the students are in a horseshoe shape and the, the more dominant students will speak, whereas they're focusing on the teacher and reliant on the teacher and waiting for prompts from the teacher, whereas I think it does um, encourage them to be more independent. Do you ever teach to the whole class, or do you always put students uh, in groups or pairs? No, quite often I teach to, to the whole class, particularly if it's a, a grammar presentation or something using the um, OHP. Um, but I actually prefer not sort of the traditional sort of teacher at the front of the class and students waiting on, on the teacher for, for prompts. I prefer for them to mingle amongst themselves or talk, talk amongst themselves. So if you're teaching the whole class, do you ever then sort of change the class? Do you ever move the furniture around in a class so you go from, say, groups to whole class or vice versa? Yeah, quite often if we're switching from a grammar presentation to a practice exercise or if I've set up a role play and then they can move um, and do that.
poetry. Poetry. Do you know this word? Poetry. Poetry is when it's like a song, but there's no music. And all the, the lines, they often rhyme. They have the same sound at the end. Okay? We've got some poetry here. So you've got some poems. Like T.S. Eliot. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh-huh. Okay. Great. Okay, last one. Frying pan. What do we use a frying pan for? Frying something, for example. Potatoes. Potatoes. You could slice up potatoes, put them in, fry them. It's uh, normally quite large and flat, and you cook with it on the hob. Uh, if you want to fry an egg, for example, you would use a frying pan. Saucepan. Saucepan, yeah. Saucepan is a small pot that you would use on a hob uh, to make a sauce in, in fact, but you can use it for other things. Okay, so if you imagine this is a frying pan, mm -hmm. quite shallow and large, a saucepan mm -hmm. is quite, well, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. It's more that shape. Okay, and then a larger one we would call, I would call that a pot, a bigger pot. Yeah. Stir. Stir. Stir is when you turn something with a spoon. Uh, if you put sugar in your coffee, you stir your coffee. What else? Scramble. Scramble. What do we scramble? It means to mix it up. So almost always what we scramble is eggs. If we're cooking eggs, sometimes we mix them up in the pan and you scramble them. Slice is when you cut like this. This is quite technical, so watch. Okay, as opposed to chop, which is this. Slice, chop. Uh, there was another... Yes, what else is there that you're not sure of? Beat. Beat. Beat and great. Okay. Uh, we beat eggs, which means we hit them like that. Uh, as we're stirring. Uh, great. 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 Yes, great. what do we normally grate? Cheese. Great cheese. And we grate cheese so that we can sprinkle it on... On pasta. On pasta or pizza. So we make very small slices of cheese by grating it. What's the difference between bitter and sour? Sour has a best taste. A bad taste. A bad Mm, a lemon is sour. Tastes quite nice. Oh. Coffee is a little bit bitter. Tastes oh. quite nice. If you eat something sour, it makes you do this. Like vinegar or lemons. Okay, okay. Uh, if you eat something bitter, you do that. So if your coffee is too strong, <laughs> yeah, it's too bitter. Number seven, the future of federal funding is up in the air. What does that phrase mean, up in the air? Still a dream, nowhere. Say again. Like still a dream is not real. Yes, so we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So can you think of one word that says that the future is... Unpredictable? Um, Unpredictable. We're not sure what's going to happen. What's a more formal word than for sure? And sure. <laughs> more formal rather than the opposite. I'm sure I'm definite. Mm, well, s so Absolutely. lovely. And the opposite. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. So the future is uncertain. <clears throat> uncertain. Has anybody, um, Idmar, have you got anything for it seems? I think. It looks. It looks. Uh, it looks. Maybe it, you could appears. say something. It appears. Maybe it looks. It like. looks as if, or it looks like, yeah, and um, would be great. It's likely, that. it's likely that. Yes. So it seems that's great. And what's the adjective? Uh, <coughs> the adjective for appears. Uh, oh, the adverb apparently would be great as well. No, that's lovely. Um, apparent. That was where I was trying to get to. <laughs> apparently and apparent. So you could say apparently instead of it seems that. Um, increasing. 
um, rising, uh, getting more, getting bigger, getting larger would be lovely. Growing would also be lovely. Um, going up. Change. Change. Change, yeah, definitely. Changing. And seeing other people is reassuring as well. That's, that's pretty similar to what I do. What's your reaction to the clips we've just been watching about vocabulary teaching? I think it's interesting to see the variety of ways in which we all teach vocabulary. And I never realised that I use that many different ways myself. There's a contrast between some of, of the techniques you use where you're actually teaching vocabulary mm. and some of the other clips where teachers are trying to get the vocabulary from the students. Mm. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I think um, it's important to elicit vocabulary sometimes and what's important is making a memorable experience when that word is, is learned. So if you elicit it and somebody gets it, then they're going to remember getting that. They're going to feel a bit chuffed and they're going to think, oh, I, I guessed that word and I didn't really know it, so I feel good about it. Or even, how did he get that word? And the person next to him might remember that. And so the, so the fact that it's memorable actually helps students to understand or remember or feel good about well, I, I think it, it gives them reference points. If, if they have memorable images or feelings while, while this is all happening. Um, there's words that they won't remember because they won't need to remember or won't want to remember, but there'll be, there'll be events that happen in the classroom with words that they want to know, and they can attach them to those events. In your clip, we watched you using a number of different techniques to present various vocabulary items. How do you decide which one to use? Um, it's quite a spontaneous decision. It's not something planned. Um, obviously, certain words lend themselves to mime, um, such as beating an egg. Um, and, for example, frying pan doesn't particularly lend itself to a mime because that could be anything, so I'll pick up a pen and draw it. I might try and mime it first because I don't have a pen in my hand, but obviously while I'm doing that, I'm thinking they're not seeing a frying pan, so I'll try and draw it on the board. I'm not a great uh, artist, but you can roughly do the outline. A lot of this, then, is just reacting to what's happening at the moment it's happening. That's what teachers do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And re reacting to, to what you're doing as well, reacting to the information that you know you're giving or not giving. We saw you what, uh, do drawing and miming mm. and you used facial expressions and you used various explanation techniques. Do you, is any of those your favourite or do you like doing them all? It's just what happens, really. Um, I'm quite, I quite like making noises as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how successful it is, but... Um, the beating of an egg, for example, it will just, it's natural for me just to go, just to add it to the, to the action of that. Um, it's nice to, to be able to perform a little bit and do a little mime and a noise and things like that, if it's appropriate for the word. OK, I'm going to stop there and we're going to move on to do a bit of reading ourselves. Um, do you recognise this person here? No. Do you? Well, Who is it? J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. That's right. Good. OK. Um, let's rub this off the board. Let's put her up on the board here. OK, we're going to do some reading in a minute about J.K. Rowling. OK. Do you know much about her? What do you know about about her? She's the author of Harry Potter. Okay, good. Okay, this side is going to be things I know about J.K. Rowling. OK. Good. Well done. Do you know anything else about her? She's a student. 
a child or children? Okay, she has a child or some children. Okay. I think she's a teacher. Okay. She's a teacher. Do you know that, or you're not sure? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, let's have a second column, and let's put this one. Things uh, we want to know, I think, or yeah. we're not sure about. Okay, she's a teacher. Good. Yeah. Anything else that you know about her? One more question that we'd like to know about her. Is she, has she died? <laughs> or is she alive? <laughs> Do you know the answer to that? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> is she still alive? It's a, it's, a, it's a perfect question to ask. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Now, what we've got here is the reading that I'm going to give you. It's an article about her, and the article is called A Suitcase of Stories. What do you think the article's going to be about, then? What's a suitcase? You should know, Miho. What's a suitcase? A suitcase is luggage. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> an item of luggage, isn't it? So when you go on holiday, you take your clothes in a suitcase. Okay, so she, what, what do you think it means, a suitcase of stories? Yeah, about, David. Uh, about uh, her life. About her life? Yes. Um, so all her stories are in a suitcase? Yes. About her life? Yes. Okay, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good suggestion. Any more suggestions? I think she talks about all the stories that she has heard. Okay, and she, maybe she keeps them in her suitcase. <laughs> all her stories that she's written, she keeps in her suitcase. They're all very good suggestions. What I would like you to do is spend three minutes reading the article and tell me what the title means. So what, do, what does it mean? <coughs> does it mean that it's a summary of her life? It, does she keep all the stories she's written in one suitcase? What does the title mean? Don't use your dictionaries, it's just quick reading through to get the general idea. You don't need to understand detail at this stage, okay? So what are you going to read for? Which question do you need to answer? What does the title mean? What does the title mean? Well done, Keiko. All right? Okay. Three minutes. Okay, and stop. Any ideas? Martina? John had been in Portugal. Yep. And she had that suitcase of fantastic stories about Harry Potter. When she came back from yep. Portugal. Mm -hmm. That's right, so she must have written the stories about mm -hmm. Harry Potter in Portugal. Okay, and then when she came home... She brought them back in her suitcase. Okay, simple. Well done. You were nearly there. Um, what I would like you to do now is just quickly read through it again with your partner and discuss um, the points on the board. Are these right? Does it mention these points in the text? Mm -hmm. And can they answer our questions? Can the text answer our questions? So just go through the text again to find out if it mentions these points and if it can answer our questions. Okay? Uh, three minutes, just going through quickly. Is she still alive? Of course. She's rich. Is she rich? <laughs> yes. <laughs> she was um, in 
income support. Yeah. I don't know. She's mm. written rich. And then the other books tell you rubbish. Mm -hmm. And uh, is lovely. he still still alive? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Let's just go through quickly. Um, is this right? She wrote Harry Potter? Yes. Okay. Um, she has a child or she has a couple of children. Does it tell you about that? No. It doesn't tell you. Okay. She's British? Yes. Well, it says that she, yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, so she can speak English, but of course. I think, yes, that's pretty much confirmed in there. Uh, she was on income support. She had money. We don't know about that. But what about she's rich now? I think we know she's rich. Um, she's a best-selling author, so I think it's quite clear. Um, she's a teacher. Yes. Yeah, um, okay. All oh, right. Okay. If you want to change it, perhaps not now. Now she's a writer, so we could change it to she was a teacher. And has she written any other books? No. no. no? Yes. 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 Marco. Another book called Rabbit. Called Rabbit. Called Rabbit. Yes, another book called Rabbit. Yes. Excellent. So yes, she has, and it was called Rabbit. <laughs> okay. Is she still alive? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You think yes. Does it tell you in the text? No. It doesn't tell you, but from general knowledge in the classroom, is she still alive? Yeah. Yeah, she is. I think she's still writing them. <laughs> I think she needs to finish nine, no nine novels, I think. So, uh, yes, that's, uh, she's got, still got a bit of writing to do. So we could change it to she was a teacher. And... Has she written any other books? No. no. no? Marco? In the reading sequence we've just watched, you asked uh, the students to tell you what they knew about J.K. Rowling, who is the subject of the, the reading text, um, long before they actually got to the reading. Why did you do that? Um, well, t first of all, to generate some interest in the topic that they were reading. Um, and uh, to give them their own input into the task, um, to share their knowledge and experience of the topic. And uh, for any students who, who might not know anything about J.K. Rowling, they would benefit from, from the collective information that we put on the board. And also, um, afterwards, it served as a second reading task when we went back and, um, and checked for the information, so they were reading for detail. So um, mm. it had two purposes, really. Is this something you, you always do in reading lessons, or, or was this rather special? Um, to begin with, I always try to um, generate interest in the topic of the reading, whether it be through the method I used just then, or through vocabulary, or pictures, or video, or songs. Um, they have to have some interest in the topic. They've got to be motivated to read. Um, and it stops them from just reading a text cold as well. Um, so they have some background information about that topic. The next thing you did is you got them just to try and find out what the caption to the text meant. Why did you give them that reading task? I wanted them to read to get the general idea of the text, to read for gist. And I, I set them a task to give them a purpose to read and to get the gist from the reading text. Um, if, um, if I hadn't set a question or asked them to predict what the title meant and then check their predictions, then they'd just be reading aimlessly and um, perhaps getting hung up on all the individual words and what each sentence means. So I just wanted them to read quickly through to get the general idea of the text, which is, which is a valuable skill to have. Um, we read for gist um, all the time. We're skimming through different texts and um, they need to be able to learn to do that in a, in a foreign language. And what did you do after the sequence that we just watched? After the sequence we drew out some language from the reading text which was the past perfect. Um, we highlighted 
different sentences from the text and um, looked at them in context and tried to understand how we use the past perfect tense. And do you always do that? Do you always try and get language out of the text like that? I often try to do that. Um, if I want to teach them language, it's always useful to see the language in context first. Um, I don't always do it, but it's, it's a good method of, of teaching language, I feel. ask you to do now, we're going to do a bit of speaking about what you read. I've got four questions and I'm going to give you two questions each. Um, they're different questions, okay? Have a look at them. There's one. There's two. So, can you be my partner for one minute for an example in S? Okay. Um, which one have you got? One. You've got one and two, so I'm going to ask you number three. Ines, when do you usually read? When? Mm. In the morning, the afternoon, in the evening? In the afternoon. In the afternoon? In the After in school? The, yes. Okay. Good. But in summer, maybe at night? Yes. At night. Before going to bed. Before going to bed. Before going to bed. Excellent. Okay. Now, she can return the question, the same question to me, but she doesn't have to repeat what she says, what, what I said. What can she say to me instead? And you? And you? Okay. Or? How about, how about, you? You? How about you? Okay, so... And you? <laughs> um, I usually read um, when I'm on holiday. Okay. I love reading when I'm on the beach. Okay. <laughs> That's my favourite time to read. Then Ines can ask me her first question. What is it? Mm, number one or two? Don't I don't mind. mind. Have you read a good book recently? Oh, yes, I have read a good book recently. I think I told you about it yesterday. It's a Chinese book. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, it's called Empress know. Orchid. Yeah. This is what you need to do. Take it in turns and then um, return the question by saying, and you, <coughs> and have a quick chat about your reading habits. Ready, steady, go. <laughs> Oh, yes, I, I usually read um, in the afternoon too. Yeah. Oh, but recently, uh, oh, some of that book is I don't I did not read top one. Oh, no. <laughs> Mm. What type of in time you read most? Mm. Mm. Maybe. Mm. I like music, so I uh, I read the music uh, about uh, about. Mm. I <laughs> I read most my dictionary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done, everybody. Really good. Um, just one thing. What's the past of read? Read. Okay. It's funny, isn't it? Because you have the word read, you have the verb read, and then the past simple. It's the same spelling, but the different pronunciation. So here we have read, and here we have read. Like the colour. Okay. Same with the past participle as well. Okay? Read, read, read. Um, and and one more thing, just to double check. So, when I'm a child, where's the mistake with that? If I write that on the board, when I'm a child. Okay, change that to the past. Well done. It's a simple mistake, but just to make sure. When I was. Okay? Good work. Okay, I'll rub that off the board. Let's just have a little bit of feedback. Um, 
Okay, Sari, tell me one thing about Rowena. Anything that you found out. Um, she, when she, whenever she wants <coughs> to read, uh, she... <laughs> uh, when she reads a book, yeah. she oh, sometimes, uh, almost she, she reads a uh, novel. Okay, she, she usually reads yeah. novels. <laughs> Say it? She usually reads novels. Good. Okay, thank you. Well done. Um, David, tell us one thing about your partner. We're going to do now, um, we're going to do about a, a five minute speaking activity and then we'll finish for the day. Um, and I just wanted, if you could look on the board, I've got this problem sometimes is that I forget, um, I've got oh, a, yeah. this illness that. Yeah. When I write, I forget my vowels, and I, oh, I need I you to... I know, it's terrible. I've been, yeah, and terrible. You've, got to, you've got to help me with this. So just have a look at this. Um, oh, 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 I got better for a second. I really do have problems. Yeah, it's terrible. I don't know what to. I've been to the vowel doctor. I get a bit of a vowel supplement. The the weather in England. Uh, sorry, this is a this is a word which has no consonants at all. In a country, the weather in a country has a great effect on its people. And, and, and its culture. culture. It's, culture. And its culture, fantastic. The weather of a country has a great effect on its people and its, and its culture. Okay, so I, what I'd like you to do now is just five minutes. Could you brainstorm some ideas, some examples of how the weather changes or has an effect on... Uh, the weather of maybe your country has an effect on the people um, who come from your country and also the culture. And if you compare weather and culture, you might find some similarities or differences. So five minutes, please, um, in your groups. So the places you walk, usually winter time, we are staying in the cold more than the weather do affect the Chinese people a lot because uh, I'm in a city which uh, we eat a lot of hot food because the weather is so sticky and humid. So, so if we uh, eat hot food, then we can we can just yeah. um, sweat a lot. Sweat a lot. Uh, not the uh, for, for what? Yeah, yeah, a lot because in here, even if it's summertime, they are not eating cold food. Just <laughs> chips. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the weather here is just cool. And it's yeah. not like uh, not weather anywhere like else. How about Spain? Well, Spain is hot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it depends on my city. Yeah. Winter is very cold, and summer is very hot. I mean, it depends on the way we live. It depends a lot because in summer people is in the street until very late to a.m. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in winter... And the siesta. Yes. Yeah. And in winter there is no siesta. <laughs> in summer, yeah. almost everybody. Yeah. Is. It's really good. I'm sorry, I'm going to... Have to I'm going to interrupt you just in case I don't know if you're going to go off and play football. Um, we're going to come back to this tomorrow and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the different areas where weather and... Uh, or how it, in areas in, in which weather can affect um, people and culture. And tonight you can do some research into, because as you know, the weather in this country is so warm and bright, <laughs> and the people are so warm and... Yeah. <laughs> it's so lovely. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, you've been brilliant. This is what you need to do. Take it in turns, and then... Um, return the question by saying, and you, <coughs> and have a quick chat about your reading habits. Ready, steady, go. Why did yeah. I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you normally say that kind of thing? I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, I think it's like starting.